thank you um, to everyone for joining us and thank you to BZ um, for allowing everyone to have access to such an amazing athlete and for you to give them advice on some of the questions they have. So we're super excited to get started. I'd like to thank Ariat for coming up with this creative idea and I hope you guys get a lot out of it. Let's just get started. So the first question I have that came in, what are some flat exercises that you do to get your horses to not ignore your rain aids, kind of running through the bridle issues? Yeah, I think I would do a lot of transitions with a horse like that. Um, if they're, they're strong, obviously a lot of downward transitions and um, really get the horse schooled to the half halt, which uh, they, a lot of horses just run right through the half halt and they need to respect that. And a lot of stopping them, backing a little, um, just any transition from canter to trot, canter to walk, they've got to do that uh, canter to walk transition without any trot steps eventually. And uh, just get them, you just have to be a little more demanding. And probably to do that, your position needs to be quite strong. Um, if the horse knows he can pull you out of the saddle, he's going to do that time and time again. So you have to really, I tell my students to get their shoulders behind their hips and brace in their heels a little bit when they go to do a strong half halt or a strong, a transition, downward transition so that the horse feels that he can't pull you forward and can't pull you out of the saddle. And then they'll start to respect it a little more. Someone says that their horse fights them in the bit. And sometimes the longer they work, the worse that their horse gets. Could this be a bit problem, maybe a subtle fit problem? It could just be the horse being strong or do you have any advice there? So kind of a similar question. Without seeing what's actually happening, it's a little hard to answer. But I think for sure a bit or a saddle is a consideration to to check or try a different bit. If you can just go to a snaffle at some point and try that. Um, because if the problem is the horse doesn't want to take the bit, um, basically a snaffle is the easiest thing or even a rubber snaffle, but I don't really know the situation. The other thing is just to make sure the horse is schooled to the, to the leg and to the hand that they re they react to the leg and the hand. And I think, uh, the other thing is to look at, uh, make sure as a rider that you are, are not too stiff in your arms and not riding with too low a hand because I see that a lot in, in these days. It's a little bit fashion to ride with a lower hand um, in the equitation and stuff like that. But uh, really, if you have too low a hand, that puts pressure on the bars of the horse's mouth and that's uncomfortable for them. So if you have a straight line from your elbow to the horse's mouth, you're more likely to keep the bit up in the corners of the mouth, which is where it's more effective and more comfortable for the horse. And kind of sticking with the theme here, what are some of the most fundamental exercises that do you think are important for beginner and intermediate riders? Kind of that they must master to have a successful future in riding in general, whether that be the hunters or the jumpers. I think the most important thing is a strong basic in your position because that's what gives you all the functionality of being able to use your aids and being able to be strong enough you know the horse weighs 1100 to 1300 pounds and not even the strongest guy is going to outmuscle a horse so the important part is your position because it's efficient and it gives us strength and the leverage that we need to ride horses so that's really important um i think the rider's strength and being able to keep their position is important so riding, riding without stirrups, staying fit in general is a good thing to do. Um, basic dressage work is good on the flat. Um, trying to expose yourself to anything you might see in the ring and, and other things as well. You know, we have a, we're lucky here in New York uh, at our home, we have all the natural fences out in our field and we have very simple little banks that, uh, that the horses can do even when we're walking or trotting around the field. Then I think it's always good to, you know, you're never going to be able to recreate everything you have in the ring because there's always surroundings around the ring that you're, you're never going to be able to recreate at home. So it's good to expose yourself and your horses to different things at home so that they have confidence to do what you tell them, even when they're distracted by other things. Somebody asks, what are some exercises a trainer should teach to a green horse to have a successful future in jumping? 
That's a lot the same answer as the rider. The horse needs to know the basics of flat work and dressage. Um, you know that and jumping is really a natural instinct for them, but you can always improve their jump with gymnastics, things like that, exposing them to what they're going to see in the ring, um, whether it be a hunter that needs to see all the flowers and the, and the gates and the, and the walls and things like that in front of the fences. Um, or a jumper that needs to see some of the colored fences, maybe some natural fences, if that's where you're, if you're heading somewhere that has those. Um, and again, expose the horse to different things, go on trail rides, go on, you know, try to find some natural fences or maybe a fence like a, a straw bale or a barrel or something like that, that wouldn't, they wouldn't see all the time, but they need to be exposed to different things like that so that there's, when something does surprise them in the rain, they're, they're not afraid to basically trust you that you're going to, what you tell them is correct. And now we're going to kind of switch gears to some questions about you, BZ, and some of your rituals and things that you do. So one of the first questions I have in that category is what kind of fitness work do you do with you and your horses? Well, for the horses, we have a walker here at home and in Florida, and I think that's really good. Um, I think it helps a little with their fitness, but basically helps with their health, I think, because they, they're, they're bred to live in a field, basically, or live in the wild. So they, they move constantly when they're out in the wild. And I think any time you can keep them out of their stall and doing something is good for them. Um, the other thing is, uh, I would say we give them four or five days a week. You know, again, it depends on their show schedule, but four or five days a week uh serious flat work and or jumping if we if we jump one or two days a week um the other thing is the rest of the other days one day we might do just like a loose hack which the horse can stretch and and uh try to if they'll do it with their heads down that's a good thing but i, I don't pull them down with the draw reins i just try to encourage them to stretch down and throw some galloping in that day with it and then another day probably just a trail ride you know just a very light and it again it depends on the horses a young horse we might only ride ride them four days a week you know a three or a four-year-old or five-year-old they they don't need every every day of the week drilling so i would probably do one day in the field one day trail ride two one or two days trail ride and a few days of really trying to teach them something so again, it varies on the horse. For myself, um, I try to do three days a week in the gym. I have, I have a trainer that helps me in Florida and now we've done uh, FaceTime with him here. So um, that really has helped keep me in better shape while I'm not showing. And you know, in the gym, it's basically, he tells me what to do, but um, it's a lot, it's really the whole body that he tries to work on. He, you know, core strength, leg strength, upper body strength, um, some balance, some uh, aerobic stuff, but uh, really just all around work on the body. And the next question here, and I love this question, throughout your writing career, what has been the biggest personal victory? So not necessarily the biggest win, but a moment that really sticks with you when you look back. Yeah, you know, when I think about this, I have, you know, a lot of moments that meant a lot to me we had i had authentic that we bought when he was six years old and he took me to my first olympic games and then i had judgment who was very scared of water obstacles when we got him and throughout his as he was a young horse so but we were able to win some big derbies with him at spruce meadows so that was a pretty cool accomplishment as well and there's a couple world cup titles and when i think about that really the most impressive thing is that i've had a lot of years of success and I think that's what I'm most proud of that uh, you know people can have one horse that they're really successful with maybe another one myself and my husband and our team and our team of owners and everything we've been able to come up with a lot of horses throughout the years that's carried my career for a long time and I think that's that's really the most thing, thing I'm most proud of. Another question we have here is before competing, are there any mental, physical, emotional rituals that you do or recommend to people to help stay focused or get rid of any pre-show jitters that they may have? 
I'm kind of a bad one to ask about this because I've always had a pretty easy time with uh, nerves and what we call show jitters. But I think one thing that has helped me over the years is really just knowing that I'm prepared for what I'm doing. Um, I don't try to do something that's impossible for me to try to do at the show, you know, or, or, or show a horse in a class that he's not cap we don't think he's capable of. I think all that helps. Um, make sure you're, you've done anything that you've practiced, you know, practice everything that you're going to face in the ring. Um, and then I like to be organized with my equipment and make sure that I'm, you know, I'm not last minute running off for a pair of spurs or a stick or something like that. And that the horse comes up with the proper tack, um, that I get on early enough that I'm not in a rush. Um, I think even when I'm a little nervous before I get on the horse, once I get on, I'm fine because I'm concentrating on what I need to do to do my job. Um, other helpful things are if you have a course, I try to seg segment the course into parts, you know, the course as a whole can look pretty overwhelming, but if you break it down into parts, you know, maybe the first line, then you maybe group two or three other fences together and you realize, yeah, I know how to do that. And I can do that. And I've done that before. And I think that helps you a remember the course and b um, realize that if it look, even if it looks difficult, it's really possible to do. And it, just different segments that you've already practiced or done before um, and I think that I find that really helps the only thing I've also tried to do is if you go in there trying to worry if you're worried about making a mistake when you go in the ring that's that's not a great attitude the attitude you want to have is that you're going to go in there and you're going to show off how good you are and how well you can do it so I think that's really helpful as well how can you build a stronger bond with your horse? It's always nice to spend a little time in the barn with your horse. I always get my first horse ready, um, and tack him up, groom him, everything else. So and while they're busy mucking, the grooms are all busy mucking. So um, I enjoy that because I get to know a little more of the horse's personality. And um, I think the same with you know, sometimes I take them out and graze them. I see them in the paddocks. I, you know, just really pay attention to the horse, not only when you're riding it, but how he is around the barn, how he is the paddock, things like that. I think you get to know them a little better. Um, and really just riding and working with the horse. We're not like jockeys who just meet their racehorse, you know, with racehorses, they meet them and they, maybe they exercise them on the track one or two times before a big race, but uh, mostly they just meet him at the races and I think uh, we're really lucky and I think you should take advantage all the time of being able to ride your horse at home and and work with it even if you're, if you're not jumping and not taking a lesson and things like that it's still important to spend time with them. Okay and then I've had a couple questions come in via email as well as on zoom about finding distances. Some people asked about exercises to help yourself see those distances as well as just the striding and if you're struggling with finding the correct distance. The most important thing is to not really have it in your head that I have to find a distance. You know, I think it's a similar, similar mentality to worrying about making a mistake. Um, I think you have to go in there knowing that some distance is going to appear some distance is going to uh, show itself to you and maybe it's the last stride or two maybe it's hopefully it's before then but I think exercises that you can work on it with is I think beginners just basically learn to do it when you're jumping a line you know maybe the in is a little messy or something but you can learn to measure the stride by knowing the number of strides you're going to do down the line and measuring that to the second fence. I think that's the first step in trying to establish some timing. Um, another exercise is you can maybe start with a rail on the ground because <laughs> it's easier, but uh, I like to count down, you know, start with three, two, one, and jump. And then eventually, you know, that you can start farther and farther back, start six strides out, and then make yourself do six strides to that rail and see how you can actually adjust the horse's stride to to meet the 
number of strides your goal is. Um, we've sometimes done it all the way to 10 strides, which is kind of fun because you might be cantering in place by the time you get to the rail. But um, I think when you do it between three and seven, it's pretty realistic to try to uh, start to see it that far back. Okay, great. What are some of your favorite flat work exercises, um, either on a flat work day or just warming up? Yeah, I think any, any kind of uh, basic dressage uh, movements are good to practice. Uh, lengthening and shortening the stores' stride is important. That's a good thing to do as you're warming up because that's really, you know, just something they need to be sharpened up on before you go in the ring. Um, I think if I'm allowed, you can watch some of our videos on the, on the Madden method on YouTube. Uh, we do, a, I've done some segments on basic, uh, basic movements like shoulder in, shoulder out. Without getting into detail here, you can go on and watch those. Um, those are good to see. Um, you can read books about a lot of different exercises. Uh, Bert and Emothy's book is good. Um, I don't know some of the modern ones these days, but just trying to teach your horse flying changes and things like that. You can, you can do a lot with uh, flat work before the actually asking them to do a flying change to teach them that. So um, it's, there's, you know, just anything that you're teaching the horse to respond to your aids to is a good thing. Another question we have here, she said she just started riding again after having a year off herself from a knee injury. And she's wondering kind of, how to get back into it. They're pretty specific here, so I'll just kind of let you give some advice in general as to coming back after a personal injury rather than a horse injury. You know, for the rider, I would just follow doctor's advice. I don't know how serious the knee injury was. If it was a year, it sounds fairly serious. So I think you can kind of tell your, your body will tell you how much you should be doing. <laughs> um, but as far as the horse, if he hasn't been in flat work or anything, I would say probably a good six weeks to two months before you start to jump a little. Um, maybe you could throw in a jump or two after four to six weeks, but nothing real serious till he's actually been working for probably a good two months. Then you can start to build up some courses and, and low fence, more putting more fences together than in that period of time. We had a couple questions surrounding people wanting to work at a stable. I'll start with the first question that we had come in on this one. They asked when someone wants to come work for you, either as a rider, a groom, a working student, etc. what skills do you expect them to have or would want them to have? Well, if we took on a working student, we don't have so much a uh, place for riders, or for people who want to ride a lot, because we just don't have a big volume of horses here where, you know, we have a small volume and try to keep it high quality. So what, I guess we would be looking for somebody that can do some grooming, um, maybe some, a little bit of exercise riding for me, but we're really kind of all set with that. So we're not a great example of that, but I would say the most important thing, if you want to be a working student is to always present yourself well. Um, you need some kind of quality that somebody is attracted to you for, um, that they want to put some time and some financial uh, financial backing basically into you if you're a working student. Um, because basically the fact that you're a student is they have to teach you, you know, a lot of things before you, before you are really useful to them. So um, it is a bit of an investment for them and you have to impress them with something that, uh, they they feel like they want to put the time in with you whether it be your personality just your personality um your 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 riding skills are important for some other people it might be uh grooming skills or just management type skills you know maybe you're a real organized person and they're a good person to do entries and travel organization and stuff like that so there's a lot of different things you can do in this industry luckily and uh one big thing too is you, I always tell people to pay attention to their Facebook and uh, uh, social media parts because that's the first thing when we get a resume or th something that somebody wants to be a working student, we check them out on their on social media and see what kind of person they are and how they 
how they present themselves. So just remember that when you when you're posting on social media that it, you're it's out there. I think for any any kind of job hiring, somebody's going to look that up. Definitely. Somebody asks, my goal is eventually to work at a stable that specializes in the sale and training of young horses, but I find myself sometimes struggling to take the necessary risks to get there. How did you approach the risks as you've progressed through your career and some of the uh, risks you took that kind of made you the rider that you are today? Yeah, I mean, our, our sport can be a little dangerous, so it's a bit of a test of bravery and but at the same time, intelligence too, you know, you don't want to do stupid things. And uh, I think you just have to develop your skills as a rider first, you know, with a horse that if you're luck, really lucky, you can do it with a horse that knows what they're, what they're doing already. And then uh, if you do get a young horse and you're a little inexperienced, hopefully you can do it with along with a trainer or somebody that can help you, you know, as you get going to to tell you what to do and also maybe sometimes to hop on the horse and, and and help you out along the way just to push you over the hump sometimes if you get stuck and uh, I think yeah I mean you, you you need to take risks but they need to be educated risks and that's always the tricky part of teaching or developing a young horse you have to push them enough that they're going to make advances but you don't want to push them to do something that's going to that they're really going to fail at and then you lose their confidence and you go backwards three steps you know there's going to be ups and downs and and things like that but you don't want to have big steps backwards that, so just keep that in mind when you're making your decision all right so we have about two questions left here first of the two is coming from someone who sounds like they're a trainer she asks, how can I help my clients understand the importance of transitioning through horses to excel in different levels? Yeah, I think that's the same as, you know, stretching yourself <laughs> enough to advance and not biting off too much. So I think, you know, as we start, you need a horse that's a bit of a schoolmaster and knows what he's doing. Um, maybe he's not as fancy as some of the others, but you're going to get good experiences in the ring. And then I think you, you definitely outgrow a horse like that eventually. And maybe you need to move on to a little more quality horse or one that can jump a little higher and take you a little farther. And um, sometimes when you try that horse, it might be seem a little difficult or a little <clears throat> maybe too much horse for you. And that's a bit, that's a balance. You know, it has to be a little bit more horse than your other ones so that you can advance, but not. Uh, beyond your capabilities of handling and, and and stuff like that so you want to you really have to rely a lot on your trainer's advice there um, it's a bit of a feeling you know it can, whether you're going to be able to grow into being able to handle that horse or if that horse is actually just too much for you so it might not be a hand in the glove type fit <laughs> you know in the very beginning but um as long as it's within your capability to advance and be able to um, learn to ride that horse, I think it's an excellent thing to be able to move forward. And that's, that's sometimes tricky to do, but for sure you outgrow one horse and have to move on to the, other, to the next one. And that's just a part of, part of learning. And then the last question I have um, is if you have any advice um, when it comes to good stable management, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to stable management. So uh, that you can learn a lot by just hanging around the barn. Um, even if you're just somebody's student, if, if if you're allowed to, some some stables don't like it when everybody hangs around. But uh, if you can start to show that you can be helpful around the barn, I think that's a big part of, you know, people then start saying, hey, this kid's kind of trying to learn and do things and they they help you along the way and I think that's the best way of getting to know horsemanship around the barn um, again we have some mad and method videos that can help you with that too but really it's it's experience you know hanging around the barn and you never know when there's going to come a situation where the vet comes and looks at some horses um, maybe a horse colics and you learn how to handle that while the horse is colic you know when you see how the people handle that um it's just a 
there's so much to it. It's a big subject and it's, yes, you can read about a lot of it in books or watch videos. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of good books out there with it, but um, the best thing you can do is experience hanging around the barn if you have the chance, the opportunity. No, thank you guys and thanks for the, the all good questions and I hope you guys got a lot out of this and yeah, enjoy your time getting back in the show ring. <laughs>